Hello there and welcome to episode number 198 of the Deeply Rooted Podcast. I'm your host Robin Norgren and here you will find stories, essays, conversations, journal entries um, that I hope draw us together and help us to understand each other a little bit better, uh, give us the ability to have more empathy and to ease the loneliness and to have a sense of community. And I'm so glad you're here. Do you remember the book called Gerald and the Purple Crayon? Well, I happened to find a series of the Harold Purple Crayon books, which I honestly had no idea there was more than one. Harold and the Purple Crayon is a special one for me on a couple different levels, and I don't know if you've read it before, but if you have, or if you haven't, just that I take a few moments to share some words from that story because I do find it's a story that has a lot of meaning to it for me and I wonder what it will mean as you hear it today. So here we go. Harold and the Purple Crayon. The series is by Crockett Johnson. One evening, after thinking it over for some time, Harold decided to go for a walk in the moonlight. There wasn't any moon, and Harold needed a moon for a walk in the moonlight. And he needed something to walk on. He made a long, straight path so he wouldn't get lost. And he set off on his walk, taking his big purple crayon with him. But he didn't seem to be getting anywhere on the long straight path. So he left the path for a shortcut across a field and the moon went with him. The shortcut led to where Harold thought a forest ought to be. He didn't want to get lost in the woods, so he made a very small forest with just one tree in it. It turned out to be an apple tree. The apples would be very tasty, Harold thought, when they got red. So he put a frightening dragon under the tree to guard the apples. It was a terribly frightening dragon. It even frightened Harold. He backed away. His hand holding the purple crayon shook. Suddenly he realized what was happening. But by then Harold was over his head in an ocean. He came up thinking fast, and in no time he was climbing aboard a trim little boat. He quickly set sail, and the moon sailed along with him. And after he sailed long enough, Harold made land without much trouble. He stepped ashore on the beach, wondering where he was. The sandy beach reminded Harold of picnics, and the thought of picnics made him hungry. So he made out a nice, simple picnic lunch. There was nothing but pie. But there were all nine kinds of pie that Harold liked best. And when Harold finished his picnic, there was quite a lot left. 
He hated to see so much delicious pie go to waste. So Harold left a very hungry moose and a deserving porcupine to finish it up. And off he went, looking for a hill to climb and see where he was. Harold knew that the higher up he went, the farther he could see, so he decided to make the hill into a mountain. And if he went high enough, he thought, he could see the window of his bedroom. He was tired and he felt he ought to be getting to bed. He hoped he could see his bedroom window from top of the mountain. But as he looked over the other side, he slipped. And there wasn't any other side of the mountain. And he was falling in the air. But luckily, he kept his wits and his purple crayon. And he made a balloon and he grabbed onto it. And he made a basket under the balloon big enough to stand in. He had a fine view from the balloons, but he couldn't see his window. And he couldn't even see a house. So he made a house with windows. And he landed the balloon on the grass in the front yard. And none of the windows were his windows. He tried to think where his window ought to be. He made some more windows, and he made a big building full of windows. And he made lots of buildings full of windows, and he made a whole city full of windows. But none of the windows were his window. He couldn't think where it might be. He decided to ask a policeman. The policeman pointed away. Harold was going anyway, but Harold thanked him. And he walked along with the moon, wishing he was in his room and in bed. And then suddenly Harold remembered. He remembered where his bedroom window was when there was a moon. It was always right around the moon. And then Harold made his bed. He got in it. He drew up the covers. The purple crayon dropped on the floor. And Harold dropped off to sleep. What do you take away from this story today? What are you creating for yourself today? across a book I was not even aware of um, by one of my favorite authors, Lauren F. Winner, and the book is called Wearing God, W-E-A-R-I-N-G. And uh, last night I was reading the segment on clothing, and I thought you might find it intriguing. And definitely I would encourage you to read any of her work. It is just truly it's exquisite white writing, but it's also um, very thought-provoking. Here's what she says about clothing. Ever since God clothed Adam and Eve in, his, in their full humanity, clothes have not only protected us from the elements and kept us warm, they have also profoundly shaped our identity and our sense of self. It is not surprising, then, that clothing is an image that runs all the way through Scripture from the first mention in Genesis to Revelation, where the gathered community of worshipers is clothed in robes made white by being laundered in the blood of the Lamb. 
to my eye the image sitting at the center of all the Bible has to say about clothing is Paul's startling statement in Galatians 3. As many of you, as were baptized in Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. Quote and unquote. God doesn't just clothe us with skin or rabbit fur. God clothes us with God's own self. This seems a pretty radical thing for Paul to say. Intriguingly, scholars believe that this metaphor is original to the Pauline writings. In the ancient world, it is not unusual to speak, as do First Peter 5 and Colossians 3, of putting on virtues. This is a common rhetorical device used to encourage people to adopt or practice various worthy qualities. But nowhere in the ancient liter literature does there appear to be a clear parallel, writes New York scholar Roy Geale, to the Pauline rhetoric of being clothed with a person. And not just any person, God. Maybe it's that clothes figure more centrally in my daily life than kings or shepherds. But I find the notion of God as clothing to be endlessly suggestive. I have some sense of what my clothes do to and for me each day. How they act upon me, when they, what they mean for my life and identity. What might it mean to understand myself as clothed in God? What does it mean to imagine God as warm winter coats? As a handmade suit? As a beloved cardigan sweater purchased in Galway on your honeymoon? Chunky purple wool with fishermen's knots. I've come to a department store in Raleigh to see what I might see in Galatians 3 if I read it among actual clothes. If I read it among the racks of jersey dresses and boiled wool, wool jackets and burnout velvet tops. I sit down on the floor next to the entrance of the dressing rooms. My back is against the wall, my corduroy tote bag beside me, my Bible on my lap. I half hope I look innocuous. I half hope someone will ask me what I'm doing. The first thing I notice is a large poster of a woman strutting down a runway in an outfit I could never afford and would not be caught dead in if I could. She seems to be wearing seven-inch heels. And appropriately enough, the caption at the bottom of the poster reads, The Height of Fashion. Fashion is a noun calling to mind Paris runways, models in Jean-Paul Gaultier creations, L and Mary Claire magazines. But fashion is also a verb. It means to mold or to shape. We fashion dough into the shape of a bread loaf. We fashion clay into a pot or a bowl. Indeed, the word fashion had that meaning, the action of making or shaping something. Before it became the noun designating clothing, and fashion came to designate apparel precisely because clothing shapes us. And this is why some of us enjoy clothes so much. Why we love changing our clothes and trying out a different look. Every time we change into a different kind of clothing, we can play at being a different kind of self. Let me end it with this. Two words where you, two verses where you hear the words clothe used in the Bible. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. 
just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And here's 1 Peter 5.5. 5. And all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. More excerpts from my journal, Diary of a Creative Entrepreneur. March 31st. I started posting more artwork for sale on Shopify, which posts to seven main social media channels. That's about all I was able to manage. I haven't done any YouTube videos this week other than the example videos for the Unimi class. So I think that will do. And I only listed three items to resell. No word from Trader Joe's. I saw a post for, kinderg for ki a kindergarten teacher Monday through Thursday. And one location is about 15 minutes away from the high school. My meeting is supposed to be today with the director from the preschool I'm at. I feel ready to spread my wings in my business. I invested $2,600 in business mastermind groups. And I need to execute on all that I have learned. I am proud of myself for pushing through with YouTube and Etsy and some TPT stuff and the big leap to Shopify and posting my art for sale on Instagram. April 1st, last official day at the preschool. I agreed to move into a substitute teacher position, so I am subbing next Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. She's going to get back with me on the sub rate, but she promises it won't be lower than the rate I'm at now. I don't even know what to say to that. They do have someone for the position, but she doesn't start until the 11th. I'm sad to note that Trader Joe's didn't even send an email saying I wasn't selected. I did see a potential job on Craigslist, a kindergarten teacher, Monday through Thursday, and you get to use their curriculum, so I did submit my resume, but the post was already three days old by then. Which means after Friday, the business is the thing. I noticed I got some new followers on Instagram and realized someone had shouted me out in her stories. A friend from when I was a kindergarten teacher and I felt super touched. And I got three I got two sales on the monster sewing kits. <laughs> 